It is the end of another month and today I thought I would share with you all of my thoughts and opinions I had on the books I read in the month of October. I have 15 books here that I would like to share my opinions on. I'm going to keep the reviews as brief as possible, however I am planning on making a video for at least maybe like one or two of them so I'm not going to talk about them in too much detail. And if you enjoy videos like this and you want to see more of them then don't forget to click the like button leave a comment down below and hit subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. I don't have a particular order in which I'm going to talk about these books other than I'm going to start off with the books that I rated the lowest this month up until the books I've rated the highest. So with that said let's talk about the first book which I only gave two stars and that was Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami. To say that this book was a massive disappointment is the understatement of the millennia. I have read books by Murakami before and have really enjoyed them but this was such a a letdown for me personally, especially considering that this book is considered as one of his most famous works and the book that basically made him the international success that we know him today. The very basic plot of this book is that it's about this boy named Toru who is reminiscing about his college days in Tokyo and it's about the relationship that he develops with these very two women, one named Nanako and one named Midori. The book discusses a lot about loss, begoing sexuality, mental illness, etc etc. Now I love books where not much happens and I would absolutely be down to liking a book like this. However, it, the reason that I didn't is purely based on how it was written. Murakami writes from a very male gaze perspective, which some people will be down for and accept and some people will not like. I for one don't mind it so long as it is done with nuance, which basically this didn't have. I saw someone online actually defend Murakami and says that he just writes it in the way that Murakami wants to write it and sees it from that perspective, which I think is very problematic. To me there were just so many sentences and passages that were just so pervy and evocative without any substance or purpose other than to just shock the reader, which I'm not a fan of. I mean I'm not against it. Literature is designed to evoke emotions out of a reader and I'm here for it and I understand it and I totally get it. But I just felt very icky and disgusting um, while reading this. I also didn't like the characters. I thought that they were incredibly boring and I don't mind books with dislikable characters. You will see this later on in the video. But I just honestly didn't care about anything that happened to these characters which is obviously not a good thing considering that this is a character driven story. Honestly I think if you are wanting to read this book I would honestly just recommend listening to the song of the same name by the Beatles you'll honestly get way more enjoyment and satisfactory than reading this. Now onto the books that I rated 3.5 stars. We have The Road by Cormac McCarthy, which first and foremost, this edition that I have, this is a Waterstones exclusive edition and it is honestly beautiful. Like whoever designed this honestly gets a gold star and should get a pay raise in my opinion. This is a post-apocalyptic novel where after a very vague catastrophic um, occurrence occurs um, that has basically obliterated all that we have created and the vast majority of the world's population which you know is an expected staple of the vast majority of post-apocalyptic stories. It follows these two men, a father and a son, over a period of months uh, where they are going on this very strenuous journey along this very freaking long road in hopes to find some sort of salvation. The book won the 2007 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and you can definitely see why that is because it is very well written and I would say is by far the best part of this book. I will say if you're not a fan of books where there isn't any clear speech marks or has any conventional writing tools I would step away from this as it does require a lot of attention to to figure out what is dialogue and what is in a narrative. I also think this book is a really stunning meditation on the denial of mortality and grief and that commentary kind of aids in the overall tragedy of the book. That being said I just don't think this was particularly for me. I thought the plot was very mediocre and it didn't keep my interest throughout. I do think that it is worth the read and worth the merit that it has but it's just not something that I think I would be returning to anytime soon. However this was adapted into a film and has some pretty good ratings so if I'm convinced enough I might check the film out. 
we'll see. The Bridge by Bill Coinsberg. This is a young adult contemporary story that has a very interesting concept. It starts off with these two main characters, Aaron and Tilly, and they are both at the George Washington Bridge, and both of them are contemplating and pondering whether to jump off. There are four scenarios that can happen in this situation, one of which is where Aaron jumps off and Tilly doesn't, Tilly jumps off and Aaron does it, both of them decide to jump, and both of them decide not to jump. And what this book does is that it explores all four of those scenarios and it explores ha what would have happened to either of the characters and the people surrounding them in their lives. This book is a very apparent message that everyone's lives matter and that life while hard is worth living. And the book does a very transparent way of portraying that. This was actually a reread and I think this is a testament that I often enjoy books a second go around over the first time and I think that's due to the fact that you know what's going to happen so you can appreciate things more. For example, I like the characters a lot more this time around and I understood what they were feeling and why they were feeling the emotions they were and I think also they all acted in a very logical way and how the people around them acted felt very appropriate. With that said, I think that the writing is a bit cliche and I wasn't a fan of how everything was executed for example, the scenario in which both characters decide to jump, there is this one scene where basically somebody goes into this library to try and find an account of something. I can't remember the specific details, but there's this inner monologue which basically goes something on the lines of, if only there was somebody else like me that I could have read about, surely someone must have felt the same emotions I felt. And I don't know if I'm a cynic when I say this, but not everyone is that special. And it really, really, rubbed me the wrong way in what the author was trying to do. This book was a mixed bag because while I think it was very realistic in its portrayal of mental illness in young people and it has some very harrowing scenes and discussions of suicidal ideation, there was just a lot of things I wish that the author did differently. So I would say do your research and look at other people's review first to determine if this is something that you want to check out or not. War Horse by Michael Morpurgo. It's a children's war novel set during World War One, told from the perspective of a horse named Joey. Now when I first heard this my initial thought was oh this is told from an animal's viewpoint. This could be a car crash. Luckily, I really enjoyed this. This was actually another reread for me. Atmospherically, it's a very poignant and a very sentimental read. I think kids who read this um, will get a very good sense of the bleakness of war and the fight for hope that the characters feel throughout the story. This book famously won the now titled Costa Book of the Year back in 1982 and it has been adapted for both stage and screen and it's considered Mopurgo's best work. I have only read one other book by Michael Mopurgo which was The Amazing Story of Adolphus Tips but I do hope to read more of his in the future because I have heard great things about Private Peaceful and Shadow and the likes of such. The Remains of the Day by Kazura Ishiguru, another riri which this time I was surprisingly did not like as much as I did the last time but I am willing to reread it in the future to see if my mind would change. I mean this book won the Booker Prize for Fiction in 1989 and was adapted into a film which starred Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson who got nominated for like eight Academy Awards so if that's not evidence enough to show that this book is objectively good, then I don't know what is. This book is set in the mid-50s in Oxford about a man named Stevens who is a long-serving butler at Darlington Hall who decides to take a road trip to visit one of his former colleagues. Whilst he is doing this, he also recollects about the events of his life as a butler during the 1920s and 30s. It's a very standard Ishiguro storyline if you've read multiple books by him before. If I'm being honest, I just just don't think I care about the practice of being a butler enough to completely enjoy this. I mean, a lot of the book is about the main character talking about, you know, the practice of being a butler, what it means to be a dignified butler, what makes a great butler. And while I can appreciate it, I just don't think, I just don't find it interesting. It's the same way for me with like cars. I can appreciate someone's passion for them, but honestly, if it can take me from point A to point B, 
I don't need to know about the finer details. Having said that, I did like what this book had to say about regret and loss and if having dignity is worth it if you can allow yourself the time to process actual grief and death. There is some fascinating scenes and character studies and I think Ishiguro is very good at making unlikable characters very relatable in some respects. I think maybe I was just not in the right mindset to reread this and if given another shot in the future maybe this will become one of my favourites. Now onto the books that I rated 3.75 stars. Kerry Soto is back by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I have been on a Taylor Jenkins Reid binge over the last month in which I've read her three most recent publications. I have still yet to read anything she has done pre The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo but I do hope to get around to that at some point. Nevertheless I think I think this is my least favourite of the works that she has done thus far. Not that it's bad, but it just didn't hit as hard as, say, Malibu Rising, which I'll talk about later. The story is about Kerry Soto, obviously, <laughs> who is a very infamous sports star who currently holds the record of the most Grand Slam titles in tennis. However, as she is watching the 1994 US Open final, um, Nikki Chan, um, who was another tennis player, is now one step closer to taking that title from her. So after six years of retirement, Kerry Soto decides to get back into the game to prove that she is the best tennis player the world has ever seen. This book is very well liked in the booktube community and has been considered as one of her best works since Seven Husbands, which I don't seem to recognize for myself. There is a lot of sentimentality within this book in the main character's relationship with her father and what it means to be a formidable woman in sport and how the media tries to demonize you. It also did the impossible of making me care about a sport for once in my life, but yet it just didn't pack the same amount of punches I know the author can do and has done with previous works. The writing and the plot was okay, but not as strong as she is capable of doing. I liked the characters, but they weren't as memorable as some of the other ones that she has written. It's still an enjoyable read, and I do enjoy her works. I just wasn't as in love with this as I wanted it to be. East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Considered as his magnum opus and the most ambitious novel of his career, this is a multi-generational book set in the Salinas Valley between the beginning of the 20th century and the end of World War One. It follows two families, the Trask and the Hamiltons, and how their stories interweave. It is also a reimagination of the story of Cain and Abel from the book of Genesis in the Holy Bible. Due to the nature of this video, I can't say too much without it dominating the whole thing so I'm just going to reserve most of my judgment for its own video in the future. That said, this is a striking example of a book that I appreciated its merit but did not fall head over heels for. My main gripe that I have with this book is that I did not like the portrayal of the female characters in it, more specifically of Kathy, and because the author decides to talk about the main themes and ideas about halfway into it, I felt that the last half was very dragged on and monotonous at times. The writing is still brilliant and I would still consider Steinbeck to be one of my favourite authors of all time. Atmospherically, the book is also so incredibly captivating and I didn't mind the fact that this was such a tome of a story just purely because of like the overall tone and the overall ambiance of the book. I am excited to read more of Steinbeck's work, in particular Grapes of Wrath, I'm very excited about picking that up at some point in the future, but I'm I'm just disappointed that I did not love this in the way that Steinbeck probably would have hoped for. Now onto the books that I rated four stars, My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Marshveg. What a very strange book indeed. There are many ways that you can read this book. On one hand, it could be read as a satirical commentary on the privilege and capitalism. On another, it could be read as a tender account on grief and being in denial about that. Conversely, it could also be read as a representation of an America pre-September 11. All three interpretations, I think, are as valid and arguable as each other, but 
it also stands alone as a very fascinating yet tragic story of a girl's narcissistic and problematic ways of taking basically an extreme health day off. It takes place in New York between 2000 and 2001 and it's about our unnamed protagonist who despite being very wealthy and privileged um, is severely depressed. So much so she decides to intensify her use of prescription medication in an attempt to sleep for an entire year in the hopes that she can shift her mental outlook on the world. There are a lot of brilliant things that Moshfeg does in this book. In particular, I love the way that she shows two very different aspects of how mental illness can affect people. The main character has a very cynical and apophatic way of approaching things, while her best friend Reva is filled with such superficial positivity and is plagued with this notion of having to fill this void within her. There is also a lot of humour and wit and it is a very good example of a of basically black comedy writing. And what sold it for me is the ending. That last chapter was so haunting and chilling and I would go so far as to say it's one of the best endings that I have read in a very long time. The plot does go a little too haywire for me personally and at times it, there are some questionable moments for me personally. That said, I will easily read more of Moshfeg in the future because I thought that this was very good. The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath, which again, this cover is absolutely stunning. Considered as a semi-autobiography and the female equivalent of the Catcher in the Rye, this is about a woman named Esther who goes to New York for an internship for a women's magazine and it follows her experience and interaction with the other interns there, the terrible dates that she goes on, her experience of almost getting married and then her later descent into what is considered today as either clinical depression or bipolar 2 disorder. This is Plath's only novel and was published about a month before she committed suicide, which makes reading this a lot more sadder and a lot more tragic than it already is. Conversely, this is a book of two halves for me. The first half I thought was a bit sluggish and it just wasn't personally as engaging or gripping, but the second half was when it really picked the pace up and it became way more intense and way more interesting for that reason. The opening line of this is one of the strongest openers I've ever read and I just wish that it continued with that strength and evocativeness consistently throughout the book and sadly it just wasn't meant to be, but I still really enjoyed it and would still highly recommend it. I really like the commentary on the hollowness of standard expectations, especially for women at that time, and how limiting it was and can still be to this day. Also, the portrayal of psychiatric medicine is brutal and shocking, and I cannot believe that this was something that happened at that time. It's really harrowing at times actually to read. Also the writing is fantastic and I would honestly consider reading Sylvia Plath's poetry because she just has a natural flow with her writing style. The only other thing that I want to mention in regards to this book is its comparison with Catcher in the Rye. Firstly, while I understand that the, well, obviously Catcher in the Rye was published more than a decade um, before this book was published, is it not interesting that this is often regarded as the female catcher in the rye, but we never say that the catcher in the rye is the male bell jar? You know, just a little observation. That said, I would say that both of those books are more close cousins, in my opinion, than exact replicas. And yes, they both have young characters who talk, and they both talk about mental health, but both are still very different books and I do think that it is worth reading both as they both do and say things differently from each other and they do things differently from each other. The Black Flamingo by Dean Atta. I think it's Dean Atta. Yes it is Dean Atta. This is a young adult story of a mixed race gay man named Michael and his coming of age story from a young boy to university where he discovers the art of drag. As the book is written in free verse it is a very quick read despite the length of it. It is a literal TARDIS, but it is a very lovely reflection on masculinity, acceptance, gender, and being your authentic self. While it's not my favourite book in the entire world, I do think this is, this is a good starting point for people exploring these topics for the first time, and it's also nice to return to as it is very well executed. And now onto the books, or the book that I rated 4.25 stars, 
Boy Parts by Eliza Clark. Regarded as the male gaze flipped on its head and its writing style being described as the female American psycho, the this is, in summary, a story of a woman named Irina who takes explicit photos of average-looking men that she finds and meets on the streets of Newcastle. What Norwegian would failed to do in its attempt of being evocative and shocking with no nuance, it does to a very high tier level in this. This book explores the forbidden territories of sexuality and the acerbicness of trauma and harm and the harmfulness of masculinity. It's excruciating, it's disturbing, it's very funny but it's absolutely not for the faint-hearted. It is also terrifying to me that this is Clark's debut novel and it scares me because I just wonder where she can grow from here and what she can produce next because this was pretty freaking good. And now onto the books I rated 4.5 stars. Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This is a book of two halves, the first of which it takes place in the present day in 1983 and the Reva siblings are preparing for their annual summer party that they host and the book is basically following the 24 hours of this party. As well as this, we also see their parents meeting for the first time in 1956 and how their actions basically affected the siblings' lives and upbringing. And <laughs> that's not really a good summary of the plot and it is a very boiled down and vague synopsis of it but honestly if I give any more details it would just ruin the whole book in my opinion. While this book is still quite well revered people do say that they do not like this as much as Kerry Soto or Daisy Jones and I'm still trying to understand that because I thought that this was brilliant. In my opinion this is a very sad yet brilliant account on responsibility and whether people should have a say as to whether being ready for something or not is an excuse. The massive monologue that Nina has towards the end of the book is honestly one of the best that I have read of recent years. I have such an admiration for people like her and the sacrifices that she made for the people that she cared about and obviously she is not perfect and she's a very full character and doesn't do everything perfectly but I honestly cared about her and what she was going through. People also turn their noses away from books like this because it is considered as a popular book and that because it is not literary it is therefore not as good by default and I think that that is such a shame because there are there is a lot of power in this book and a lot of fantastic character development and plot twists. And yes, it does feel that while you are reading this you can hear the EastEnders drums in the background. It really shows, in my opinion, that commercial fiction can be just as good, if not better, than books that do win these literary prizes. We're now down to the last three books and you will see a theme <laughs> with these last three in that all of them are just over a hundred pages because as it will probably become apparent in the future I absolutely love books that are under 150 pages. Assembly by Natasha Brown. Depicted as a modern Mrs. Dalloway, this is about a black British woman preparing to attend a party at her boyfriend's family estate which is in the English countryside. This book is about race, class, whether being safe is worth the sacrifice of freedom and ultimately a story of a woman being audacious enough to take command of her own life. The writing of this book is astonishing and is honestly one of the best written books I have ever read. It is lyrical yet electrifying, poetic yet gut-wrenching. Honestly, the writing alone was worth the like 90 minutes that I spent reading this. And although I wasn't completely engaged with the characters and I didn't have a connection with them per se, I know that on a reread I would appreciate it a lot more. Honestly, if you just read this for its commentary or the themes or even just the writing, you will not regret it because it is such a beautifully written novella. And now finally on to the books that I rated 5 stars. Ironically both of these are just over 100 pages, like 106, 104, and both of them were rereads. Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. A lot of people will know of this book because chances are you were forced to read this at school, I being one of them. However, in the over 12 years since I first picked this up, it is still one of my favourite books 
I have ever read. The book is about these two ranch workers, George and Lenny, as they move from place to place in California trying to find work, all of which is set against the backdrop of the Great Depression in the 1950s in America. I could talk about this book for years, so I'll simply boil it down to the fact that it is an astonishingly poignant look on loneliness and the tragic ways in how humanity crave for connection. All the characters are profoundly loathsome and all want that comfort of companionship but find it hard to fully connect with anyone. Also the portrayal of brotherhood and male relationships is... <sighs> it's so utterly beautiful and it's hard for me to ever read this book without getting st very extremely misty-eyed by the end of it. I think there is something to be said about me in that my favourite books are usually where everyone by the end of it is miserable <laughs> and it ends tragically. And, you know, maybe this is a cry for help or therapy, but I honestly cannot even describe the sheer brilliance of this book without sounding either pretentious or non-cohesive. I also personally find it hard that Steinbeck said in regards to East of Eden that all books prior to that release was practice for that book because this is genuinely a masterpiece of such epic proportions. Like honestly, if you take anything from this video, please read this if you haven't already. And the very last book that I will talk about today is The Testament of Mary by Com Tobeam. Um, essentially, this book is a retelling of the Virgin Mary and her reflecting and recounting her son's life leading up to his execution. That's basically the story. This is a very controversial book, especially for conservative Christians who say that this is blasphemous, and I do not want to ruffle any feathers when I say that I really adore the way that the Virgin Mary is portrayed, because the main reason for it is that we often sensationalize the Virgin Mary as being, you know, the mother of sorrows and being almost like a godlike person who has never shown a negative light. And what Comdabine does is humanise her and remind us that regardless she is still a mother who lost her son in a very tragic and horrific way. And to say she wasn't mad or upset or distraught by what happened to her is to not fully understand her whatsoever. Even if you take it away from the context of where it takes place and all of the significance surrounding it, it is still a powerful take on grief and tragedy and what it means to be a mother and uh, I, I I highlighted so many passages and quotes throughout this book and it honestly still sticks with me to this day like this is truly beautiful and I would highly recommend people to read it. Thus that concludes my wrap up for the month of October. If you have read any of these books or want to read any of these books do let me know down in the comments your opinions and let me know if you also have any book recommendations of things that I should read in the future. At this moment I'm currently reading Open Water by Caleb Azorma Nelson and absolutely loving that. I'm probably going to finish it this evening if I'm being honest. But some other books that I'm planning on reading are The Ten of Welfare Hall, Sky Song, Leaving Time, My Sister's Keeper, You and Me on Vacation, Americana, 90 Minutes, Tess of the Durbervilles, and Memorial. So look forward to those reviews and reviews of some of the other books that are behind me in the future. Thank you very much for watching and I shall see you very soon. Bye bye.